Thank you. So egg freezing 101. There's a lot of talk about egg freezing, freezing your eggs. Part of that is because it's brand new. Egg freezing was considered experimental till 2012. Do, do people are people not aware of that? No. Okay. I Fast like forward. We, there, we know a lot less than people think. Okay. Like with some of the women I spoke to, like no way. Cool. Thank you for yeah. for telling me that. So 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 sperm. We've been freezing them since 1970s. Okay. Sperm are the smallest cell in your body. They are basically highly condensed DNA with a tail. I mean, legitimate, like that is what they are. They're the easiest cell to freeze. I could teach everyone in this room to freeze sperm adequately in about three hours. For real, for real. I, I, my my, my, my eight-year-old daughter's almost there, right? Like um, she can do it. Like, anyway, so but sperm are, are, are very small and they have very little cytoplasm. And, and as such, they can be frozen and thawed very efficiently. And by the way, there are a lot of them. And so if you lose half, it doesn't matter. Um, and so embryos are more difficult, but an embryo is developmentally different than an egg. It's actually less susceptible to damage. And, and it's still smaller, because the egg, when it divides into an embryo, it increases surface area, and decreases volume each time it divides. And, it, and, and for other reasons, it's not in meiosis, so that's a whole, but, but the egg is, turns out it's the largest cell in your body. And what that means is it's got the, the lowest surface to volume ratio. And to freeze an egg, we need to remove all the water molecules. So what happens to water when it freezes? Spans, right? And so a cell has something called a membrane on it. And if you get an ice crystal, if you have a little bit of water in it, when it freezes, it becomes an ice crystal. It expands and it ruptures that membrane. So, so 10 years ago, a little less than 10 years ago, a friend asked me, should I freeze my eggs? And I said, no, because we weren't able to thaw them adequately. And, and, and there just wasn't enough reliability. And there were a few people doing it, but those of us like with, with, most of us wouldn't feel comfortable doing that in, in, in giving people, and we do it for maybe cancer patients who, for whom we did, who are about to undergo ablative chemotherapy, they'd be sterile. And, and so we'd offer them, okay, you could freeze your eggs, it's experimental, we don't know if you'll be able to use these eggs in the future, and, and the preliminary data aren't very good, or we can get donor sperm for you, we can inseminate your eggs, freeze the embryos, and that's pretty good. And that was not a great option for women facing chemotherapy with like two weeks lead time before they had to go through chemo. And so, um, so that's where we were. And then in 2010, two papers came out and a new technique was developed called vitrification. And vitrification proved effective. And for me, it was like mind blowing, right? Because we've been using donor sperm for a lot, long time in my field and using donor eggs was a really difficult process where you had to synchronize two women's menstrual cycles. One woman couldn't meet the other woman because it was an anonymous process. And so just to think about the ability to help couples who need a donor eggs, suddenly we could freeze eggs. Not to mention the ability to freeze your own eggs and delay childbearing. And, and so these two papers came out with showing this new technique called vitrification. And, and here we are today. So in 2012, both the European Society for Human Reproduction, ASRM, removed the label of experimental because there was enough data that it was safe and effective. Now it's safe and effective, but it remains the hardest thing we do in a fertility center. So that's where we are. And that's why we're talking about this. And that's why there's all these you know, conversations about it in the press, because it wasn't around before. So that's also why we started Springfield, because it was so exciting to be a part of this. And suddenly we have this new service and offering to provide. So uh, I'm going to just cover why egg freezing, what's the background. If you want, we can do it good, more granular into how it works, how it can impact your life. And, and if you want to learn a bit, little bit about spring, I'll save that for Q&A later on. Uh, but why egg freezing? So this is, is probably the best example. When you're 30 and you're trying to conceive, the average couple has about a 20% chance per month. The, the rule of thumb is, is it, it's 20 to 25% chance of getting pregnant when you have unprotected intercourse while you're ovulating. Unless you don't want to get pregnant, and then it's like 95%. <laughs> but, um, but, 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 but if you're trying, for whatever reason, it suddenly becomes 20%. Um, 
That same couple trying at age 30, who is 20%, now tries at age 40, and it's about 5%. Without any change in her health, any effect of her on, on any capacity, or, or any change in her partner. And, and that's been true for a long time. Sometimes people ask me, well, is it environmental toxins or things we're exposed to? No. We can look at birth records dating back to the 1600s and spanning three continents, and that's what this is showing you. The five-year chance that somebody has a child, uh, from Tunisia to, to, to Normandy to, to Geneva and, and, and to, um, I believe, the New World. But anyway, it's all, um, we see that after age 35, there's a decline in fertility. And it's remarkable how consistent this is across culture and across places. Do you have a question? Oh, sorry. Yes. So I mean, you mentioned before that you know, birth control has revolutionized. Um, and I also feel like there's I mean, a huge increase in IUDs and different types of birth control that are kind of more sophisticated now. I'm curious the data that this is looking at because I do think that well, women that are using maybe kind of more aggressive. It's hard because you can't see the small print. 1600s, 1700s, 1700s. This is way before any birth control pills. And these are birth records from married couples kept by like church records. So these do not take into account that. So there's a declining fertility, not by choice, because this is all pre contraceptives. Good question. Though. Do birth, does birth control pill affect your future fertility? And specifically, IUD. Absolutely not. Yes, there's been for, yes, there's been extensive research. There is no better research drug or, or technology than anything related to sex. <laughs> the birth control pills are the most researched pharmaceutical in probably the history of drugs, of modern drugs, right? Because they're they're socially like, you know, same time. So yeah, and birth control pills should be available over the counter in my view. But but you can see my bias a little bit. But, uh, but, but no, so IUDs do not affect your future fertility. There were some initial studies saying it might lead to increased tubal infertility. So if, it, 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 and, and that was this thing called the Dacron shield, and they had a braided, uh, um, like, like a braided silk string on it. Nobody in this room, I'll bet, was alive, um, certainly not menstruating, when the Dacron shield was, was available. Uh, but, but that was associated with a slightly higher risk of uh, infection. If you got chlamydia, you had a higher risk of something called pelvic inflammatory disease, which could damage your tubes. The the Mirena, or the Paragard, or or, or the new Mirena, the the, the low dose one, um, none of them increase your risk. You pull them out and, and immediately. And similarly with birth control pills. So so I wouldn't worry about your contraceptives affecting your fertility. Being on birth control pills for more than ten years, it does reduce your risk of ovarian cancer by ten percent. Sorry, by twofold. Um, I have another question. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about that. But, but, you know, so there's natural fertility and then there's assisted fertility. And so the assisted fertility, um, so this is the natural fertility slide. Now, this will get population numbers, uh, but we'll, we'll, I'll do my best to answer that question as well. Uh, what we do see as you age is, is it not only does it become more difficult to get pregnant, but part of the things is it becomes more difficult to stay pregnant. And miscarriage rate goes up. These numbers for miscarriage risk are actually an underestimate because they're using the Swedish database. So they only include you as having a miscarriage if you went to a hospital when you had a miscarriage or a healthcare center, if you had an ultrasound and a documented pregnancy by ultrasound. The number that we usually use is the 50% point for having a miscarriage, meaning half of your pregnancies end in miscarriage at age 41. By age 45, if you do conceive with your own eggs or naturally, your risk of miscarriage is around 75%. At age 35, it's probably 30%. And in your 20s, it's probably 15 to 20%. So the risk of miscarriage goes up. I have Down syndrome on here as well, because all Down syndrome is, is an error when the egg ovulates and extruding some of its chromosomes. So what it, instead of extruding one, of the, one copy of the 21st chromosome, it stays behind. And what Down syndrome means, it's called trisomy 21. It means you have a third copy of chromosome 21 instead of two. And, and, and it's no more common than any other of your 23 chromosomes. The thing is when you have a, a problem with the other chromosomes, you have a miscarriage or you don't get pregnant. So the thing that drives the, the increasing risk of infertility or the increasing risk of miscarriage 
is that the embryo, the fertilized egg, doesn't have a correct chromosome number. Something you hear sometimes people say, um, oh, the body has a way of recognizing a bad pregnancy in it. Not really. Like, like the, the embryo doesn't have the right tools to continue to grow. And that's because it has too many or too few chromosomes. That's what happens. When we talk about reproductive aging, what we're really talking about is fewer eggs, but when we talk about natural fertility, it's about the fact that your eggs are more prone to errors as they divide. So sperm are like blood cells. You know your body produces blood cells all the time? from stem cells, because there's spermatic gonial stem cells. So throughout a man's life, he produces sperm. Eggs are more precious. You're born with all the eggs you will ever have. So a, a, a little girl, a baby girl, is born with about one to two million eggs. By the time she goes through puberty, she has about 400 to 600,000. Over the next 40 years, she may only ovulate 500 times. But continually, she's going through a pool of eggs. So if somebody is not in menopause and we look at their ovaries, we can see a pool of follicles which contain immature eggs, and those can be stimulated to develop and grow at any point in your month, in your menstrual cycle. But, uh, but, but that pool gets smaller and smaller. And we don't really understand the process by which the eggs are gradually released, but you could look at a, an ultrasound of a three-year-old and, and, and you'll see those follicles. And she's turning over eggs. And, and, that, and the last egg, when the last egg is ovulated or released, that's called menopause. And that's when your menstrual cycles will stop because you need those follicles to produce estrogen, which is what thickens the lining of the endometrium. And the progesterone is what causes a period ultimately when it withdraws. So, so that's the, sort of the story. Um, I'm sorry, you wanted to ask a question? I have just a question about, um, so it sounds like you're saying that most of the issues are with Great question. So, so interestingly, the uterus and the sperm don't play a huge role. They're, they're, they're both vitally important. Right? You can't get pregnant without a sperm, um, but, and, and you can't carry a pregnancy without a uterus. But we've known for a long time that it was the egg. And you can see that here if you look at, these are IVF live birth rates stratified by age that are reported to the CDC in 2013. And the orange bar shows the live birth rate among women using their own eggs. And what you see is it declines gradually at first and then quicker, right, in your late 30s, such that it's about 10% is the live birth rate per IVF cycle nationally at age 42. Above 42, it's 5%. What's really striking, and we've known for a long time, is we can help couples conceive, we can help women well into their 50s with extremely high success rates that don't decline at all if we're using donor eggs. Donor eggs are, remember I mentioned that, that, that process, people don't realize how common donor eggs are. In fact, if you look at all the babies born through IVF in the US, it's nearly 10%. This is just 2013 data, and, and it's actually gone up, but. There were 6,400 donor infants, meaning infants from IVF cycles using donor eggs. And, and there were 68,000 from women using their own eggs. That, that, that's nearly one in 10. It's like one in 11. But nobody advertised that. In my field, we know it. Right? I can tell you which celebrities use donor eggs because we report outcomes right to this easy. So I know in 2013, there were zero twins among women using IVF over 43 with their own eggs. But that same year, there was X, Y, and Z celebrity who was pregnant with twins using IVF. And as I mentioned, egg freezing wasn't around prior. So it will become a little bit more confusing, although today we're primarily transferring one embryo at a time. But, um, but, but there's a lot of cases. Like and people are very comfortable now talking about IVF. People, it, 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 there's no stigma, but, but people don't share the fact that they had to use donor eggs. The whole point of egg freezing is to put you in a position where you don't have to go through that painful decision to use somebody else's egg because you don't make enough eggs or, 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 or sufficient quant, uh, quality. So the donor egg No. If it's a donor egg, the, the child, we always have... have 46 chromosomes for healthy baby, 23 from the sperm and 23 from the egg. So if it's a donor egg, it's, it's the egg donor's DNA. 
and, 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 the, and the sperm contributors sperm, DNA. And then the mother carries the baby and has a profound effect on the, on the life and the development of that embryo. So, I mean, it, it is a truly rewarding and, and, and powerful experience, but, but, but it's not a choice that most people would choose as their first choice, right? Um, but, but yes, it's somebody else's DNA. And so that's the, you know, that's the challenge. And that's what egg freezing allows is, is to potentially not have to go that route if you're trying to get pregnant and, and you're finding yourself having difficulties at an older age. Does that make sense? Um, and, and the reasons you have trouble, and, and the reasons it's harder to help somebody with their own eggs as they age are, are twofold. One, as you get older and you go through this process of IVF, IVF is our, our best treatment for couples having trouble getting pregnant. But as you get older, you produce fewer eggs per attempt, one. And two, the quality of those eggs tends to decline. And by quality, I just mean the ability to extrude half its chromosomes to make room for the sperm. And so that same little girl who's born with a million eggs, she's still in each of those eggs has 46 chromosomes. And it's not until she ovulates that she extrudes half of them. So what you have to picture in a cell is something called a spindle. Remember I was saying that the egg is sort of a, a fragile cell because of where it is developmentally? There's something called a spindle. Spindles are, are like tiny little intracellular strings that are going to pull the chromosomes to different sides of the egg. And then it pinches off, and that's how you get rid of half of the chromosomes. So the egg from birth until ovulation is in prophase, in a, in a form of meiosis. And, and that means the two pair copies of chromosomes are right together aligned. And we go through life, right? And we're constantly exposed to ionizing radiation, and it has an effect on us. And so tiny little potential damages to that spindle can, can add up. And the egg doesn't have a mechanism to repair that spindle. And so that's why we see more and more errors as women age. And there seems to be a threshold point, and it's not 35. In my best interpretation of this, it, it, it happens on average. And everything's on average, right? Because People are, are unique, and everybody's got different exposures and different bodies. But around 37, where we start to see a really meaningful difference in the chance of a live birth per egg. 35 is an artificial number, and it's because of it's when insurance decided they would cover amniocentesis in the 1980s. But um, so, so if we look at number, hi. And are you able to test both of those this is a great question. So, so the AMH test is not. The AMH test looks, it, it, so AMH is a blood test that we do. And what AMH measures is, is it, AMH is a hormone produced by the cells that surround those little follicles, those little resting eggs. And, and we call that your antral follicles. And so it, it correlates well with how many follicles you have. And the number of follicles that we can see in your ovary correlates very well with the number of eggs we're likely to retrieve. So we typically retrieve 50 to 100% of the antral follicle count. So if you come into our office and you get an ultrasound, you know, so on your first visit, we always do an ultrasound. And from that ultrasound, we're able to give you a pretty good estimate on the number of mature eggs that we'd be able to freeze. And so, and, and so these are data from, from Europe. It's a five-year database of, of ICSI cases in Belgium and Holland. And you're looking at the number of mature eggs women going through IVF were able to get. And what you see is in your early 20s, you might get 12 mature eggs. By age 30, maybe that number is eight. And by age 36, it's about, I said, by, by 30, it's about 10. By age 36, it's about eight. And, and by your early 40s, that number is about six. This is a linear decline. It's steady. It's real. But it's not that intimidating, right? It, it's not that cliff curve that we saw. It's progressive, it's slow, it's a gentle, straight slope. By the time you're, and, and if you look at the IVF success rates in the US, and I, I love this because you can overlay large data sets from different populations, and they, they, they always fall into line because it's biology. And when you see large data sets that are concordant, you start to draw conclusions, you know, that you feel comfortable in those conclusions. So you see that most of the decline in your early 30s correlates almost perfectly parallels the decline in number of eggs. And so that's why I say, well, I think most of the declining success rates early on in your 30s has to do with getting fewer eggs, not really quality issues. 
And sure enough, if you look at the data on the number of eggs that you need, the live birth rate per egg, and the way to do that is say, well, let's look at all the mature eggs retrieved from women at each age and, and who are doing IVF and how many babies they had, how many babies they were able to have from those eggs. And, and in other words, how many mature eggs were needed per live birth? And that's shown here in red. And I found this really remarkable, and I think everybody in this room should, should feel good about this, particularly if you're under 37, because basically you need about 20 eggs, and it doesn't matter whether you're 25 or 35. That number is pretty flat. In other words, the, the chance that any given egg becomes a live birth. Now, this is a, you're a large, as I mentioned, national database from Belgium and Holland. But, it, but what's consistent here is, is that you don't see, it's not like the quality of your eggs between 25 and 35 is really declining very much, if, if at all. Something starts to change, though, around 37, and that's where there's this inflection in quality comes into play. And by the way, any baby born to somebody who's 46 with her own eggs is just as smart, cute, competent, and amazing. It's just saying that you have a, and, 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 and that is possible. Just, we have four women this year pregnant at 44 with their own eggs. I mean, it, it happens too, but, but it's just harder. Um, so, so um, but by 42, instead of needing 20 eggs, you need about 60 for every baby born. And at 43, that number is over 100. And that's why most, the vast majority of IVF births, live births in the US to women over 42 are using donor eggs. Because it, at 42, 43, we mentioned that there's probably six mature eggs on average per attempt with IVF. And yet the average number that you need is about 120. And that correlates with what we see, which is a 5% live birth rate. So the live birth rates drop as a result of, of, of both getting fewer eggs. And this is what I was saying. Why is that? So, so now we have this cool technology that also has developed really in the last five years. And it's the ability to test embryos before you put them back in. So we cannot test eggs. We can give you a good sense of the number of eggs we can retrieve before we go through the process. But we can't tell quality. The only test of egg quality even if you have very few eggs, I have patients coming in who are 32, 31 years old, and, and, and they find out, oh my gosh, like I have very few eggs, and they're likely to go through menopause earlier. Their egg quality is still amazing. It's still 32. So, so having fewer eggs does not correlate with egg quality. Um, but now we can test embryos before we put them back. These are two beautiful day five embryos, day six embryos. That's a pre-implantation. It's about, it's, it's looking to implant. It's got an inner cell mass. It's got this area out here called the trophectum. It will become the placenta. And we can take a few cells off of that area that's going to become the placenta and send it for analysis and find out how many chromosomes it has. And if it has 46 chromosomes, it doesn't matter if she's 44. She has the same live birth rate as if she was 24 with a euploid embryo. Better than if she didn't. But what we do see is the chance of finding that embryo goes way down. So the risk of aneuploidy or, or risk of chromosomal errors increases a lot. And it increases right along the same age that we see the number of eggs that you need per live birth increases. 35 to 37, we start seeing an increase about 5% per year. By the time somebody's 42, we, we, A, we start with fewer eggs. It's harder to get to that stage. And then when we get there, 75% of them are abnormal. Over 42, it's like 85%. So that's the disheartening bit. And that's where I think that egg freezing allows you the opportunity to freeze some eggs early on so that if you need them, their chance of, of developing into an embryo that has 46 chromosomes is much better. Um, I'm reading an article that talks about the last From the cut. From New York, New York, oh, I love it. So this article is like, is, is like, is crazy. Like, um, it's so, so, so separate topic. So, so this is on whether this test is any good. And the problem. just like, if, if it tells you everything. I it guess, doesn't. I guess no test. Like, so, okay. Anybody who's ever watched House, um, Grey's Anatomy, or, or any, any TV show that has any, it drives me, I get sick. Like, like Blacklist? And they're like, oh, we're going to test and see if you're really the father, you know, like, and, and we'll get it in four hours. Oh, but 
oh my God. Like, like, so, so genetic tests, don't, so when we do this test, it takes two weeks to turn it around. And it's 90% accurate, which is amazing. And if it, if it says you have a normal embryo, your live birth rate with that normal embryo based on published studies is about 55%. We've never seen a published study with higher than 55%. So it's not 100%. And we know the test is wrong 10% of the time. So if you, if you, if you embrace, but, but the problem is that not all the docs know that, to be honest, like, cause the rep comes out and tells you it's 99% accurate. Yeah, it's 99% accurate with the same cells. The problem is, is you're sampling an embryo out here, right? And some, and this is the placenta and 4% of the time, the inner cell mass and the placenta, they do, they're not correlated because you can have errors that occur after fertilization. So you, so part of that embryo could be abnormal and that's what is they're talking about in that article. And, and then the other part could be normal. So you could be saying, hey, that's a bad embryo, but it actually isn't. So it's introduced so much doubt to people. But if we accept the fact that it's 90% it's accurate, it's the best we have, it's, it's more than directional. In a 42-year-old, the guidelines are put five embryos back. If you think back to IV, and, and, and with 42, putting five embryos back, you get a 15% live birth rate. But if you test the embryo, you put one embryo in, we currently have an ongoing pregnancy rate of over 70% above 42 with a euploid embryo. Like, like that, that's like, that, like putting one embryo in. So, our, so that makes our twin rate 1%. The rare case where that embryo divides and becomes identical twin. So it's a useful test. It's not perfect. And the other thing is you're taking four cells. And in order to do that DNA test, you have to amplify DNA. And, and when you amplify DNA from four cells, it doesn't always work. There's something called, it, 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 and there's noise. It's like, for me, tech, right? I'm like, why can't you do this? Why are there like, why? So, okay, so we change, like, why doesn't it like just transition easily? Like, I wanna do this. And then like, like uh, uh, somebody who's intelligent and like has like technical skills that, I, that I'll never have will be like, okay, it's more complicated than that, right? And, and things like there's bugs, right? And so, so, so DNA testing and, and medicine, all of our tests are imperfect. People also realize that like when we test for, we, we do something called preconception genetic testing where we test for mutations that people have. Like, they, they're like, oh, cool, I'm, I'm negative. But if you read the fine print, which nobody does, those tests might have 50% sensitivity. And people will go to 23andMe and like, oh, they, there's these 23 mutations that I checked for and I'm, I don't have them. Well, if you look at the sensitivity, so we're really good at detecting cystic fibrosis in white people. And we're really good at detecting sickle cell disease. Yeah, but, but like, like rare stuff, like, like our tests are, are not perfect. So, so, so this test is not perfect, but it's pretty darn good and it's direction. And I, and I may do like, there's like a segment on CBS next week that like we might, because that, that, that study is like, like for anybody going through IVF, it's really torturing yeah. Yeah, because you're like, well, but they said that was abnormal, but what if it's normal? And what if it's my only one? And, and it's very complicated. It's very hard, but we know it's imperfect, but it does add value in my view as long as we accept the fact that, that, that we, none of our tests are perfect. Which brings me to egg freezing, right? Because egg freezing is not perfect. And when I said 10 years ago, they said I wouldn't freeze my eggs, or I wouldn't recommend egg freezing because it was so imperfect. Well, today, most of the top IVF centers see about 80 to 86% survival rates from their frozen eggs, not 100%. That's another important thing to keep in mind, 80 to 90%. Our goal is 90% plus. We're, we're doing some really interesting stuff and I don't wanna get wonky here because I, 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 I tend to, but, but we're doing some really cool stuff and we think we can push that above 90%, but nobody's reported that yet. But um, it's, it's hard. So if you're, if you're going through this process and you're saying, well, how many eggs do I need? The other thing that people do is they say, like, it, it always drove me crazy. Some doctors say, oh, six is a good, oh, eight's a good number, 12, 15. Like, it was so random. Right, but I just showed you some data here with non-frozen eggs that suggested that the average woman needed 20 eggs. These were never frozen for live birth. So how could you say to a woman, eight eggs is great, 12 eggs is great? It's just random, right? And, and so A, it depends on your age. B, it depends on your risk tolerance. So what we do at, at Springs, we try to say, okay, here's the average number. Here's what one would expect will happen, and here's what what we what we think of, and then you come up with a number that feels good for you. Um, let's let's say that uh, like we heard that 
been by the time he was in a relationship, I don't know. How many examples kind of now in the old fashioned way with putting putting them away, how would that affect you know the change in the like in the next couple of years? Sure. So everybody's individual. So that's why, like, so this oh, this is a good segue. So, so, so we are going to introduce. We, we want people to have information. So I was talking to somebody here tonight about how, how poor our, our our reproductive health education is in our schools. So we want people to understand this. So, we, so, so we want to do as much as we can to educate people just so that they have information. We're also going to introduce something really cool next month, which is AMH testing for people in the community, and we're going to do that at forty nine dollars, and it will give you a report and an assessment of your AMH. And including that 49 hours, we're going to give people a voucher for, for a, a lift ride to spring to get their bud taken too. So, so it's really like a cause just for us to like get people information out there. Um, AMH will be a good help, but there's nothing, the ultrasound is better. As far as the number of eggs on average yeah. in your 20s, it, you know, that's what I was showing you here. It's about 10 to 12. And, 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 and then it steadily trills down. Now, um, it does not affect your future. The other question was, does this affect my future fertility? Does going through an egg retrieval, am I not going to be able to get pregnant because I went through an egg retrieval? Birth control pills will not, IUD will not, egg freezing will not. Um, will it make you have menopause earlier? No. Good question. Um, does it affect, because the eggs that we take out are going to, to die. Those little follicles, remember we exhaust one to two million eggs over the 50 year period. And every month you have these follicles that it's been six months developing before they become a follicle. Then you reach a stage of a follicle, they get receptors for something called follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. And that FSH is secreted by your brain. And one of the follicles every month sort of gets selected. It's not that it gets selected because it's the best just timing wise and the rest all die off. So if we do an ultrasound today and we see eight follicles on your ovaries and you come back five days later, I might see eight follicles again. They tend to have a consistent I might see seven follicles. It will be the same, but it will be different follicles. The ones I see today, if they're not selected, they die. So, so we're not depleting the eggs. Um, this is probably the best slide as far as like what to expect. The, and, and, and the reason you need more eggs is because there's attrition at every stage. So, so somebody who say has 24 eggs frozen, one might expect to have 20 that survive that thaw. And now that egg survives and it needs to be fertilized, right? And so a typical fertilization rate might be 75%. So 20 eggs becomes 15 fertilized eggs. Now this egg needs to divide. And most fertilized eggs can divide and about 80% of them will make it to a, a six to nine cell decent looking day three embryo shown here. But between date and that's two days later, and between day three and day five or day six, that, that six to eight cell embryo has to become a hundred cell embryo that uh, goes from undifferentiated to, to a differentiated embryo that has an inner cell mass that will become the baby and an outer cell mass or a trophectoderm that will become the uh, placenta. And only about 30 to 50% make it there. So then maybe you're down to four or five pre-implantation embryos called blastocysts. And then among those, not all of them have the normal chromosome number. Even at the tender age of 28, which is probably peak fertility, 30% of them are abnormal. I'm oh, sorry, 30, yeah, 30% 30 of them are abnormal. So then three of them would be normal. By 38, about half of them are abnormal. And, and if you were 42, when you went through IVF or, pro, so, so if you freeze your eggs at 28 and you come back at 42, you still probably have three normal. If, you, if you're going through the process of 42, then probably one out of four are chromosomally normal. Each of those chromosomally normal embryos, as I mentioned, has about a 55% chance of becoming a, a living, healthy baby. So that's, that, and, and just before I, I tell you, I don't want anybody to take away from this, that, that egg freezing is perfect. Remember I said that like, like science is messy and there's amazing advances, but nothing is perfect today. Or, 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 or really ever will. So, so this is from 2012. This is a little dated, but it's the best study I've seen. This is really, what they did was they took young women going through IVF, all under 35, all high responders, people with good prognosis, and they agreed to freeze half their eggs 
and then thaw them the same day. And, and, and the cool thing was you got to compare eggs that were frozen to eggs that were not frozen from the same woman on the same day in the same treatment cycle in the same lab. And, and the first thing, and this was at a decent, a good IVF center in, in New Jersey. And, and so 19% didn't survive. And then you look at the fertilization rate, the, the, the frozen and then thawed eggs. It's not a huge study. They probably had 15 patients in it and, and 300 eggs, but you know, in each group. And the fertilization rate was a little lower among the eggs that had been frozen. And, and the development rate, so if you look at the usable blastocyst rate, it was about two-thirds of what you got from the eggs that had never been frozen. So that's the, you know, sort of the, the, the limitation. If somebody were coming to me and said, I am married and I've been, and this happens all the time because people are talking about egg freezing. And we'll see a young married couple, and, and they're 30, and they've been married since they were like 19, and they, and they want to have a kid, but not till they're 40. And they, and they want to make sure that they've preserved that option. And so they'll come in, and it's always a little bit alarming because I'm, I'm having an egg freezing consult, and there's this guy. And, and, and then they're like, oh, but we're married. And, and, and so, so I love boyfriends, by the way, to join in the, in the process, and they tend to be very helpful. And the process going through this with your boyfriend tends to draw people together. In, in my experience, which is something I didn't anticipate. Um, but, but, the, um, but sometimes we'll see like a husband. And, and in that case, as long as he doesn't ride a motorcycle, I'll, I'll typically advise embryo cryopreservation because we can still freeze embryos. And embryos survive the freezing and thawing 99% of the time. And most of the embryos we transfer have been frozen already, and there's zero detriment to the product. Because remember I said the embryo freeze is much easier higher surface to volume ratio. You can imagine these cells are very small on here, a hundred cells with lots, very, very high surface to volume ratio compared to this. Can you imagine trying to get all the water out of this? And so we do some really cool things to optimize that, but still embryos would be a little better. Now, why the motorcycle thing? Because the great thing about eggs is they're not committed to a sperm. And so when you frozen the eggs, you're not, and if your husband, drives a motorcycle, although I think he's probably really, really cool, like it's a high risk and you may be like really in love, but like <laughs> life happens. <laughs> and, and it's a terrible thing to say, but, but it's so much easier than talking about divorce, right? Divorce happens to 50% of couples, but, but, but the motorcycle analogy is easier for me at least to explain to me like, like that life happens. <laughs> Great question. We don't think so. We don't think so. So with embryos and sperm, so with sperm, we've got 19 year data in humans. With, with embryos, like NICE, the, the, the governing body in, in England, they, they used to recommend not freezing embryos or, 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 or eggs for more than 10 years. And they just withdrew that because all the evidence are, and it's remarkable. Like, like with embryos, like you have sibling embryos frozen on the same day. One's transferred now, one's transferred eight years later, right? They are, they are eight years apart. And there's no like, it, it, so, so truly once liquid night, this is the, okay, sci-fi, I told you, okay, things aren't real, but like the one thing that's real is like cryopreservation. Once in liquid nitrogen, it's like, it's, it's remarkable. So they will be as good for longer than, than, than you or I would be around to use them, right? And then I have this other theory that like, so, so, so you may not need, if you do decide to freeze your eggs, you may not end up using them to have a child. But then people are like, well, what am I going to do with them? So. I don't want this repeated as saying that I'm advocating this as a reason for, for egg freezing, but like, but I kind of have this idea that we're going to have a lot of people who have eggs, right? And eggs are totipotent stem cells. Like that's a unique thing. And, and there's so much stem cell research going on in like cardiomyocytes. So you have a heart attack, right? And we're trying to figure out, can we get stem cells to regenerate cardiac cells? How do you, like, like somebody who needs a knee replacement, there's no more cartilage in their knee. Can you create cartilage? So, so, so I kind of feel like people are going to end up using those eggs for other things too. Okay, but, 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 but that's a total, that's not the reason to freeze your eggs, like for your future heart cells, <laughs> but like, but it may be the reason if you don't use them to like keep them frozen for a while, because like, who knows, but, but that's a very unique cell is an egg. And here's another question over here. Uh, I was going to ask in cases where, um, there are a couple of women, will you sometimes like freeze their eggs and so I, I had that question yesterday. Um, I can. I do. 
I, I usually do that more with, with serious boyfriends. And um, now the caveat with a serious boyfriend, so, so the, the one thing you have to know, and everybody knows, is, like, say you're married and you divorce, and your husband, your ex-husband now says, I don't want you to use those embryos. He, he, case law in California will support him, and we can't release those embryos. So eggs always have more optionality. But yes, we'll do one cycle with freezing eggs, one cycle with freezing embryos. Because of the efficiency of the process that, that I showed you here, I, I don't really recommend splitting the eggs because it, you, 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 you're losing on both ends. So, so if you can do two cycles, if you're, if you're lucky enough to have an insurer who pays for it, absolutely. And that, that makes a lot of sense. If you were like Google, right? And then, then your insurance pays 100%. Was there another question? So, so, um, so. So, my question was um, how do you guys prevent things like power outages? Everybody's worried about power outages. So funny. So, <laughs> so, um, so, we, so, so, how do we prevent power outages? We, we don't, but we have backups. So, so at Spring, everything is back up in triplicate. So including our gas lines, we, we, we have literally three rows of each gas, and then we have a, another array. So we have arrays. So in power, we have, I, actually, we, we own a 16,000 pound battery array. They had to put structural steel over the garage where, we, where it's placed, and that can maintain full operation for 24 hours. And then we also own a backup generator a few miles away that we can pull and plug into our, our, our building, which is crazy. Like putting that in was, was, was a big deal, but none of that's for eggs that are frozen. That's all for the embryos during those six days, only a few, like only a certain amount of patients. That's for embryos. These embryos are in incubators where we need power and we can never have a power <laughs> outage. So, so we have incredible backup power, but, but actually eggs are in liquid nitrogen which doesn't require power. So if we, we keep our tank full and we keep a full tank back up, our full tank can last for two weeks without being replenished. So, so, so we have about three weeks of liquid nitrogen with no refills. And it's refilled three times a week just to maintain it full. But, but it, it's not like your refrigerator where the power outage goes out. It's liquid nitrogen. So, so it doesn't actually require power. And, and if you just leave it closed, you're, you're safe. Earthquakes or something else people are afraid of. You know, and some, some, some people consider moving their eggs to like a storage facility outside of the Bay Area. I, I, I tend to think there's a higher risk of your truck, that your, your, your transport truck being hit, than the building collapsing in an earthquake. But, it, but, but these are all real concerns and, and things that we've had to think of as well, particularly the power outage, but more on the embryo side because we, we can't lose an embryo either. Um, other questions? Um, this is sort of a funny, this is just like how your body works, which I think people don't necessarily know, but I, I, I love, so your brain sends signals to your pituitary gland. It's not like your body has one egg per month. It, it actually has these follicles, and these are here all the time in your ovary. Even after you've ovulated, you have a bunch of follicles, and some of our protocols will actually start stimulating the ovaries after you've ovulated in what's called the luteal phase, and they do great. So, so any of the follicles that are small can respond, but naturally your brain produces FSH or follicle stimulating hormone, um, and it produces most of it early on in your cycle, and gradually one follicle grows, and that follicle produces something called estrogen, or estradiol is the fancy term, and, and that stops the production on your pituitary, and then it causes an LH surge, which is what causes you to ovulate. So when, so when you're going through IVF, we basically turn this process off, and, and you take control, and you give yourself injections of recombinant FSH. And because you're controlling that, and, and, and therefore you don't turn it off the way your brain does when it senses estrogen, you can continue that steady progression. We try to mimic it, but keep it a little higher so that all of the follicles grow and not just one. I just think that's cool. Um, I can shut up, and, and I can just take questions. Um, the process, oh, this is a retrieval. People often want to know what, what goes into that. So, so when you're going through the process, we're monitoring your ovaries. This is somebody who's got lots of follicles at her baseline ultrasound, and this is what her ovaries might look like eight days later after giving herself injections. And, 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 and the way this works is it, it's a vaginal ultrasound, so there's a transducer right here. And you can see that there's like two millimeters of tissue between the transducer and the ovary. And so on the day of your egg retrieval, we use that same exact ultrasound probe but with a needle guide and you're, on, you're asleep, and it's maybe a, a 15, 10, 15 minute procedure, 
um, under anesthesia, you're asleep, you're not paralyzed, you're not intubated, um, you're breathing, but there's an anesthesiologist there. Um, and theoretically, could intubate you. I've never seen it happen. And, and then that needle goes into your ovary, shown, shown above, literally, and shown, shown figuratively below. Um, and, and, and the egg is aspirated from that little follicle. So it's th that follicle is not your egg. That follicle is a fluid containing structure. And so 30, so, so you give yourself a trigger, which will trigger ovulation at 40 hours, but we do your retrieval at 36 hours before you release those eggs. And then we're able to aspirate them. And they're immediately taken. This is sort of the ovarian stimulation protocol. It's about eight to 12 days of injections. And when your ovaries reach an appropriate, your follicles in your ovaries reach an appropriate size, we then trigger ovulation. And 36 hours later is when we do your procedure. So all in is about a 10 to 14 day process. So why are you removing them from the ovary or the uterus? From the ovary. So your eggs are in your ovary and your uterus is where the embryo will eventually go. And how does the needle have access to your ovary? Well, that's actually, so, so when we do an ultra, through the vagina. Okay. So it's a vaginal ultrasound. And, and, and the end of the vagina is right next to your ovary. And so, and, and you can see that right here. Like, so this is the end of the transducer, which is in the vagina. And then it goes right in there. Um, the process involves probably 26 injections over the course of eight to 12, eight to 12 days. People are often intimidated by that. The needle is, the, is 27 gauges. Nobody's, unless you're a diabetic, you've never seen a 27 gauge needle. It's very tiny. And it's remarkable. We have nurses who can come to your home to give you shots, but I'd say 98% of our patients do not require that and do not want that and, and learn to get it. But, but if you, and, and people have like different rituals, right? They'll, they'll give themselves, they'll put like a chocolate right here and then they'll give them, or, or a glass of wine. And, and then after they get their injection, they're allowed to do that. And, 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 <laughs> And, um, and then people are like, I was so scared of those injections. And then, and, and now I'm like, a pr and, and people are like, it's cool. Like they're proud of it. And like, the other thing that's really cool is like when people get to see their, their ovaries and they're developing, right. And you're, and you are driving that process. So that's, what's neat about the process. It's about five to six ultrasounds during that eight to 12 day period and blood tests. And basically we're, we're measuring your estradiol. We're measuring how your ovaries are responding and how those follicles are going. And, and we're adjusting your medication. And that's why we have to adjust. And everybody's body is a little bit different. So I'm simplifying a little bit because we've got like 15 different protocols, but broad strokes, that's, that's the, the way it works. We also have something for women who don't have many eggs, like that 32-year-old woman who, who comes in who only has two follicles. And, and in that case, we can actually use pills, like, like some pills to, to cause maybe both of those follicles to grow. We may only get two eggs, but we minimize the process. We, we, we eliminate the blood tests. Maybe we do three ultrasounds, no blood tests maybe three days of, of very low dose injections. And we're able to get like two eggs. And, and, and we strip out all the costs. And some of those patients even choose not to use anesthesia. So we don't charge them the costs that we incur by, by having anesthesia. And, and, and it allows them to go through a few times and bank enough eggs that they feel like they've got a good chance of. of... Is there age limits? Age limits, there, there's no age limits. You know, I, I don't want, like being paternalistic. Over 40, I don't feel great about freezing eggs. Okay. And I tell everybody that. Now, I've done it. We've frozen people's eggs who are 42. I think that's our oldest. When you're 42, remember those numbers I showed you. Now, our statistics at spring are, are markedly better than that. But if, if 60 eggs is what you need, Nashi, and if we cut that in half, let's say, we can get a 42-year-old pregnant with 30 or 20 eggs. You still need a lot of eggs. And yet, a 42-year-old might not produce that many eggs. Is your lifestyle No. I know people. No, not. Uh, smoking cigarettes. It make, women who smoke cigarettes will go through menopause two years earlier, and their IVF success rates are much lower. Cigarettes are, always, are toxic to your ovaries. But that's the only thing that we really know. And, 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 and unfortunately, I've seen lots of like, like yoga instructors and like, I don't eat anything but organic and, 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 low, and, and with very low ovarian reserve. And, 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 but it does, but health, healthy lifestyle is always a good idea. Um, the, um, the, um, I, I've frozen eggs from women who are 42 and they tend to have very good ovarian reserve. But, but just to give you perspective on this, like, like 
it was the oldest patient I had and she was coming for an egg freezing and, and I was very much like on the page of, I'm going to talk her out of this and we're going to talk about other options. And then when we did her ultrasound, she had a ton of follicles in all her life. She had a regular cycle. And so she was a, somebody who had something called polycystic ovarian syndrome, but, but here she was. And that, remember I told you the average 42 year old gets six eggs. So, so the embryologist came in and, and said, Dr. Klatsky, like, and showed me her year of birth. And, and cause she was feeling uncomfortable. And I, and I said, Simone, just wait, like see. And, and, and we froze for her, I think 24 mature eggs in one cycle. So I feel great about that. 24 frozen eggs and you're, and you're 42. I can't wait till she comes back, right? We've got a, a great chance, right? And so, so, so everything's individual, but, but I feel much better freezing eggs when you're younger, both because you get more eggs and you likely need fewer. When we first started freezing eggs in 2012, 2013, 2014, almost everybody was 38 to 40. And the difference then, and this is just like three, four years ago, the difference then was everybody's coming in and, and they were sort of in a, sad about it. And they were like, it felt like their back was against the wall. They were like, I have to do this. And now our average age at spring is, is I think 34 and dropping and people come in and they're optimistic. It's like, hey, I got this great option. So the age, when to do it, depends on, um, on your lifestyle. So there's some advantages doing it. You know, you want to maximize your outcomes to get more, a higher number, potentially higher quality when you're younger. Um, you also may new, do fewer cycles. So a 30 year old may come in and do one cycle and be happy with the number of eggs at 38, 39. You may say, okay, I want to do three cycles of this three, a cycle is an attempt. It's that 14 day, like your menstrual cycle. Um, so our, our, our suggestion is to, is to get that blood test, get an AMH. By the way, so, so, so I told you about this AMH project that we're doing. And so everybody here, if you give your email address to, to Lee, or we've already taken care of that, cool. So everybody's going to get that for free if you want it. And so that's something that we're doing for you guys. And, 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 and then we also have this cool thing, the Spring Together program. So, so we're, we're trying to lower the cost. Like when you open a fertility center, all these banks come to you. And they want to give loans to your patients at like tons of like interest rates. So we also have like a payment plan that makes it more affordable up front so that younger women who don't have as much savings can, can, can afford to do it. Um, but, but that ultrasound in your anthropological gown, that's how you, you really learn a lot more. And that, and that with the AMH, um, other questions, is it safe? Yes. Complications are rare. Bleeding and infection occur in about one in two to 4,000 cases. Um, the babies so far we have, I put 6,000 plus births. That was a long time ago with egg freezing, but it's a lot more and, and no increased risk of uh, adverse pregnancy, neonatal outcomes, birth defects. Hormones are safe. They don't increase your risk of cancer. That's always a concern. Um, it, so does it hurt? I used to say emotional range, but, but egg freezing patients don't see that, to be honest. Yeah, with IVF, you're so stressed on the outcome. We see a lot, but egg freezing patients don't. But, but almost all of our patients feel bloating and fatigue during that process. Towards the end of it, if you're getting a great outcome, meaning more eggs, you're going to have more bloating. Lower outcome, if you're getting six eggs, less bloating. Most patients complain of feeling fatigued. Uh, it does not affect your future fertility. Can you exercise? Yes, but low impact in that last week and the week after, particularly if your ovaries are enlarged. We don't want them to twist. Uh, alcohol is fine in moderation. Dietary restrictions, no. Sex is good, but the, the last week, we want you to use contraception condoms. Unless you have an IUD, you're fine. Just in case one of those eggs slips out, the idea is to have a pregnancy when you want. <laughs> Not by accident. And I used to put this, like, should I tell my colleagues? Colleagues depend on your work situation. You may, if you're covered, you know, people may have gone through this. If you work with a lot of women who understand it, like, you may be, you may be comfortable. If, you, if, you, if you're working at Uber or somewhere, maybe you don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, that was unfair. I've frozen so many people's eggs from Uber. I should never have said that. It was bad, right? Okay. Uh, that was, un but, 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 uh, but, but Uber covers, but, but, but I'll tell you what, but Uber covers egg freezing, which is remarkable for two cycles for all their employees. So, so I mean, who knows, right? Like Salesforce, Uber, eBay, they, they, it's a, it's a, hundred, it's, it's a covered benefit. I think eBay, it's like they cover 90% of the cost. Um, so that's pretty cool. And in boyfriends, I always, I was really curious how this would affect relationships and it's been really interesting. So it takes the pressure off a lot of the men. So most of the time the boyfriend is like, well, you have to learn to give me the shots and do this. And, and, and the interesting thing is, is usually by the time we're doing the egg retrieval, if a boyfriend is, is there, 
he's like, so about the embryo freeze, because, you know, we're all insecure and, and we meaning men. Um, and, and, and suddenly you're looking at somebody who's like, well, she's taking care of this and, and I'm not a part of that. And, 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 and so I've seen that multiple times and it's been interesting. Um, so, so we can send these to you. Just take it easy. You know, we're so busy. We're so crazy. We have so many things in our life. When you're going through this process, it's actually a good time. And a lot of patients say that, like, like they just, they go home a little earlier that night to take their shots and they don't go out as much. You can go out, but some people take their shots, like going to the bathroom at a wedding, right? If they have to, but like, but, but you can also use it as like two weeks to like be your healthiest version of yourself. And, and, and get a little bit more sleep and a little bit more rest. And, and we find people um, doing that. It, it, is whether or not you, to do this, it, it's a really personal decision. Um, when do you anticipate your first pregnancy? Can you manage it? The work, the, 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 can you manage it at work? We open early in the morning. We're open seven days a week. We open at 7 a.m. so that people can get to work after their, you know, get their ultrasound. That's about a 20 minute visit. Um, and, then, and then be off to work. Um, you know, economic costs absolutely play a role. We, 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 we've tried to create this no interest payment plan to make it easier for patients. We've uh, negotiated with pharmacies on behalf of our patients so that our patients get like really great discounts, but the meds are still expensive. Like I, I think our medication costs for our patients are probably a thousand dollars less than anywhere else because we, we advocated, we actually negotiated and said, we'll, we'll refer you our patients if you cut the prices and we'll change pharmacies if you, if you, if somebody else would do it cheaper, but it's still a lot. Um, I'm going to shut up right now because I think I'm going too long. Got it? Yes. Question. So how, um, how many eggs is typical for each cycle? It all depends on the individual and their age. So it depends on your age is if we're looking at big populations. The late 20s on average about 10 to 12. But, in, but, but the only way I can really give you a meaningful number. So if I did an ultrasound, let's say it was 18. I, I count you, wow, you're going to get somewhere with 85% confidence. So that antral follicle count, 85% of the time we get 50 to 100% of that number. So if that number is 16, I'm going to tell you 85% of the time we get 8 to 16. 10% of the time it's a little higher, 5% of the time it's lower. So that, that's when I get numeric, you know, but I don't like to say it because everybody's different and, and you really don't know. That's always the most uncomfortable part of the initial visit because you do the ultrasound and, and and once I see like an ovary where there's like lots of follicles, like, okay, so we can have this conversation and, and you, you're a good candidate. And sometimes you have to say, well, you know, we have a different strategy for this. And that might be that minimal stem approach where, where the, the medication costs are, are far less and the treatment costs are far less, but the expected outcome is limited. And that's the, the idea of that is like, if you're gardening and you have two seeds, just giving more fertilizer is not going to result in 15 plants. And, but giving too much fertilizer can, can actually harm those seeds. So that's where we use this thing called minimal stimulation. And, and it works great. And we get a lot of people pregnant who, who wouldn't be able to afford to do multiple IVF cycles, but can with a minimal stem approach. Like Sure. So the different components, right? So, so egg freezing, currently it's spring, it's 8,500. And if you do the payment plan, there's like a hundred dollar processing fee, but it's, it ends up being like 2,800 and, uh, and then $159 a month for three years, which is 8,600, you know, at the end of the day, the medication costs, we, you know, it used to be like, you'd be quoted like four to $8,000 and, and you didn't know, so, so basically, if you're in a low dose patient, you could we we can create a package where it's 3,700. If you're what we call a moderate dose, it's 4,100, and high is 4,500. So, so the medication costs ballpark figure 4,000. Um, we don't put that in the payment plan because it's not it's it's an it's not our cost, and and so um, ongoing storage is 300 dollars every six months, and. Um, when you come back for the eggs, it kind of depends what you're doing with them. But I would figure at a low point, it's probably 7,000. If you want to do that test, that genetic testing, that adds another 4,500. But, but it's much cheaper at that point than if, so say if you're doing that, 40, that genetic testing, maybe that's 11,000. 
But if you're going through an IVF cycle at that point, instead of using your frozen eggs, that's going to be 17,500. And then you're going to have a higher medication need. So, so if, if, if you end up using the eggs, it's super cost effective because you're getting more and more. I mean, like if, you're, if everybody in this room said, I know I'm going to need IVF later on, then it's a no brainer, right? Like, like it's a really, but the challenge is that it's an insurance policy, you don't know. Sorry. Um, so I've learned a lot about taking care of the egg itself that comes from the ovary. But let's say I freeze my egg right now or in a couple of years, I'm 29, and then I come back five years later, I want to use the egg. Is there any risk that now my uterus can, for some reason, not host that egg and be infertile? The uterus, like not, not speaking about the whole thing. Very low risk. This graph continues out flat. So, yes, you can get fibroids, but those are surgically correctable. You can develop, it's very few patients who have uterine factor infertility. That's why we don't see a declining success rate when you're using donor eggs. Independent. So what you see here is maternal age. And when you're using donor eggs, it's pretty flat. So it's, so yeah, so, 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 so no. I mean, like, yes, you can, you can, it's, so, so fibroids, which are removable, something called adenomyosis, which is pretty rare. But we, but most uterine challenges are fixable. Okay, sir. Miscarriage is because, so, 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 so using donor eggs, remember I said at 41, 50% of pregnancies had a miscarriage, unless you're using donor eggs, it's, it's the age of the donor that predicts your miscarriage risk. The egg, the embryo. Exactly. It's the embryo. And if we tested the embryos, you remember that test that we talked about that was like, there's that article, you know what the miscarriage risk is? For a 41-year-old with tested embryos that are chromosomally normal, 5 to 10% versus 50%. So, so it's, it's not a perfect test, right? That's why it's 5 to 10% because it's not a perfect test. But, but, and, but we know that, right? And so it's like, okay, 90% accurate. Sometimes we put in a good embryo and somebody still miscarries. And when we test it, it's abnormal. But 5 to 10% versus 50 per, or more percent in your 40s. What about, um, so my two last I am so happy you asked that. There's not good data in those studies on this. I feel very, there's only one place. So, 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 so I, so I encourage patients to be the healthiest version of themselves. Um, about I, how long before? You know, there are a lot of women who go out and get really drunk at a party in college after three days and like go to Ibiza for like four, there are a lot of babies being conceived at, at Burning Man. And like, you know, anytime somebody finds a small finding, like, like, like there's two stu like really terribly designed posters that there was a terribly designed poster presentation recently that showed like marijuana affected sperm count. And it never got published. But it got picked up on every major news outlet because it involved drugs and sex and reproduction. So, so like, but, but there's all these guys in Jamaica, like Rastafara, like guys with 12 kids, right? Like, like the data on marijuana is so bad. Like it, it, if it was a, a real thing, cigarettes affect your eggs. You go through menopause two years earlier because you smoke many of them a day. But, uh, but I try to reassure people. There's one fertility center that, that tells you, I, I never heard this until I went to San Francisco, and this one center in the Bay, not in, in the city of San Francisco, has people stop dairy, gluten, and alcohol for three months <laughs> on zero evidence and zero data. I just feel that's cruel. Like, I mean, because like people are like going on dates, right? And they try to explain why they can't have dairy, gluten, or alcohol, but they don't want to share like on their date, like, well, I'm freezing my eggs. And, and, and so, but <laughs> patients like think this guy's like amazing because he's so attentive. Anyway. So the data suggests that 
there, smoking cigarettes is bad. I would smoke, stop smoking cigarettes for six months before. It could take six months for that egg to develop to a follicle. But be your healthiest version of yourself. Get some sleep and, um, and don't destroy your life in trying to do this. Most medications that affect pregnancies affect them after implantation when an embryo is developing. So they don't hang around or affect the egg. Like Retin-A or something that you, know, you can't take absolutely when you're pregnant, you would stop it, but they don't affect the egg itself. Zika, travel. So if you travel to a Zika zone, we want you to wait 60 days. Yes, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which should be renamed polyfollicular ovarian syndrome. And that's the one time in your life, if you have that, that egg, you're lucky. Because then you go through egg freezing, you get more eggs. These you have more follicles. Yeah. No. Not, if done well, no. You, you can, you, people suddenly get scared. We, no. Yeah, there's, there's some study, there's a lot of studies on this. You know, it's hard to say, like, because with IVF, there's no such thing as somebody going through IVF who's not stressed. But, um, but, but, but egg freezing patients tend to be less stressed than IVF patients. Um, but that's why, I, I mean, I think stress is not good for our bodies, period. So to the extent that you can minimize that, that's great. If you figure out how to, let me know. Um, <laughs> Things change gradually. You know, I showed you how that, that, that declining egg yield, it's a, it's a linear, slow, progressive on, on, on average. So it changes more rapidly as you get older. But, but you saw the number of eggs. And all those tests measure is the number of eggs you're going to get. And is there one test that Well, the ultrasound's the best, right? Because then I can give you a number. Like, so when somebody comes into my office, even if I don't have an AMH, I can give them an estimate of how many eggs they would get. And that's that 50 to 100% thing. The blood test is just easy. But the blood test is hard. Like, I had a patient refer to me the other day who had an AMH done at Quest, which is a, you know, a good reference lab. And it was 0.4, and she was totally freaked out. And her doctor was too. And um, that's very low. And um, but her ovaries looked amazing. Right, and she had like twenty. And I was like, no, no, you're, 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 you're good. And and so so and, and I actually repeated the AMH. I, I haven't got it back yet, but but um, so, so tests are like that. It can fluctuate a little bit, but it's better than nothing, right? And it and it's good. It's a good start. And if you see a low number, great. You might find out that it was a false positive test result. But more often than not, it's pretty. It's directional. Somebody said directional in here at one point. I like that. I think I'm gonna steal that term. Um, so I'm going to hang out for a little bit. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them uh, or, or, or do my best. Um, but thanks for your time. Thanks for coming. We love gathering. You want to come up, Patricia, and, sure. and close I, out? I don't know how much to say, but first of all, thank you to Dr. Sachin. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I mean, amazing presentation. It was great. It was like we got like some Stanford education right here tonight. So cool. thank you why you didn't go to Stanford. I was UCSF. But, close <laughs> but you also went, what is can you tell just the background? You actually have a long list. It wasn't just UCSF, right? No, no. So, I, so I, I went to school on the East Coast at a, a small liberal arts college, Amherst College. And then I, then I went to uh, Mount Sinai Medical School. Did, you, did somebody go to Amherst here? Stuff. Or NESCAC? Yeah. Ooh, awesome. See, we need you. Team Pride. Um, five colleges. So, so, so yeah, so, so um, I went to Amherst, and then I, went to, and then I took a year off, and I, and I was – a human rights activist in, in, in uh, a, a, working with Burmese refugees in Southeast Asia, and that got me really passionate about global health. Yeah. And then I went to Mount Sinai uh, for medical school, and then UCSF, and then back to Brown for, or then to Brown back to the East Coast, and then I was at Einstein. And, um, and, and super lazy dude, just lazy. And and, and, but, and then we, uh, but but what Lee mentioned too is really important to us. So, so we like we don't want to be just like, the best IVF center. We want to be part of like we, we, our goal is to be a reproductive partner. Yeah. Right. So, so, so now early on, it's about contraception and, and, and helping you find the right contraception. Now that's not what we do, but we work with Planned Parenthood and we work with, with our, with our gynecology partners and, and, and preserving your fertility, proactively managing your fertility and controlling that. And then if, if you're trying to get pregnant and you need help, we want to be there for you. 
but we also want to be there for people in our community who aren't as fortunate as we are. And so, so we, so when I was at Einstein, I started this program. It's sort of like Uber. And now I'm going to give Uber a, a shout out, like Uber for rural health centers in, in Western Uganda. And so it helps women with obstetric emergencies um, at rural health centers where there's a midwife who's trained, but there's not access to a C-section. And, and, and then we, they can call it, they just hit a number and it sends out robo calls. It's not using data or, or yeah. smartphones, but it, it's, if you want to look at mamarescue.org, that's my other passion. Yeah, um, actually, that was one big reason that I was really pro having you speak. Besides your academic, you know, your excellence, like that really showed a little bit of the warmth of your heart, which matters to us. Um, and I also that also tips my hand that, or tips me off to thanking Lee because if it weren't for Lee reaching out, we would not have. Happened. And I wonder if you want to just ensure that everyone knows about how to get their AMH testing. Definitely. So we have.